All righty, guys. All Facts Media here. We have an, 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 another edition of Coach's Corner, and today we are joined by BU head coach Marissa Mosley. Hi, how you doing? Also, of course, joined by my twin brother, Andrew Robinson. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. Um, coach, we want to learn a little bit about you first. Obviously, you've had a, a, quite the journey from playing at BU, obviously hopping into coaching, being at ESPN even for a year, um, and obviously been being at UConn for, for nine years and uh, Minnesota as well. So talk to us, to us a little bit about your journey from, from playing basketball, you know, um, just, just your journey to, to what brought you to ESPN and then what, you know, brought you into coaching and how you kind of got, got to BU today. Yeah, so um, I grew up in Springfield, Mass, and um, my dad got me into basketball as a kid. I actually started as a soccer player, but realized quickly how much running that was and not a lot of action. And so um, once I got the ball put in my hands, um, I, was, I was into it. Um, and so played at BU and thought that um, I wanted to do broadcasting. And so... Um, Went and worked at ESPN, was fortunate enough to get a job straight out of college as a production assistant. So you're cutting highlights for Sports Center and ESPN News. And I, about 10 minutes, 10 months into the job, I was like, I don't think this is for me. Like, I, I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. It was an incredible first job because everybody was my age that was working in the department I was working in more similar ages. Um, and so there was a lot of camaraderie, but I realized that they were about making great television, not necessarily about sports per se. And, um, and I wanted to be able to impact people's lives in a different way. And I thought, okay, I had been told by a lot of people that I should coach. I decided to try to go in a different direction and lo and behold, I'm coaching. So um, somebody else knew my calling before I even admitted it to myself. But um, from there, got into, uh, was really fortunate at the age of 23 to um, become a Division One assistant at the University of Denver, was there for two years, and then went to Minnesota for two years, um, and then UConn for nine. And I had worked UConn's camp when I was in college um, because there wasn't a lot of, of uh, women's basketball in the summers in Springfield. So my coach had advised me to do that. And I always tell my kids, like, you never know who's watching you and how you carry yourself is so important. And Coach Ariama's daughter, um, you know, co-signed for me. And I, I hadn't seen her talk to her since camp when I was 18. And 10 years later, she's like, you, you need to hire Marissa. And so um, just a kind of a testament to doing things the right way, showing up on time and being respectful and all those types of things and doing whatever you're doing, you know, having a winning mindset and doing it with excellence. And so um, that got me a job at, you know, arguably the best basketball program in the country and um, at 28. And I was nervous, but I was excited. And it was a decision that markedly changed my life going forward. And so I spent nine years there. We went to nine Final Fours and was fortunate enough to win five national championships while I was there. And Coach Ariama um, included us. Uh, he was the Olympic coach two times. He included us his first time in London, which was an incredible experience and um, decided, mm, I was nervous. I didn't think I was going to coach. I thought I had convinced myself that I was going to get out of coaching because I was afraid that I would fail being a head coach. And so that fear of failure is real. <laughs> it is very real. And so I told anybody who will listen that I think it's time for me to like go in a different direction. I think I'm going to try something different, but in all actuality, um, I was just afraid to take the leap. And so had several conversations with Coach Ariama and when BU opened, you know, we kind of talked through um, that this would be a great starting point for me um, as a head coach and it being my alma mater um, that, you know, it's in a great city um academically was in line with what I was as a student I could sell that um and then in a conference that I felt like we could win and so um it kind of checked all the boxes in that way and yet and still when I got there I was completely overwhelmed and <laughs> was like ah, I think I made a terrible mistake can I come back um because who leaves UConn right it's just it was such an incredible experience but um, what, what you realize really shortly is, um, anything that, you know, that you're going to have success in and you're going to have to work at, there is always going to be a period of growth and growing pains are real, you know, in order to get better, you have to be stretched. And so that first year was absolutely that for me. 
And, um, and then I really started to feel like I came into my own towards the end of that first season. And this last season was just so much better. Just, <laughs> just no, not, not first of everything, you know? And, um, yeah, so going into my third year now. Nice. Uh, I mean, you're somebody who's been a winner throughout your whole career. Obviously, being a part of an NCAA tournament team at BU back in 2003, you know, you go to Denver, you're part of a 21 program there. You go to Minnesota, two NCAA tournaments, and obviously, you know, what you did at UConn speaks for itself. Just kind of talk about, you know, your just being able to be part of a program, you know, like, like UConn, win five national championships, um, and just what it was like to just be around so many great players, um, you know, the Brianna Stewart's of the world, and just what was that experience like for you? Yeah, I mean, initially, you know, I came in, like I said, at 28, and you've got Maya Moore and Tina Charles, the stars of our team, and, you know, so many other incredible players, and Kalina Green, and Kylie McLaren, and, you know, the list goes on that don't necessarily always get the recognition, but are incredible players in their own rights. And um, for me to um, step into that role and be like, what am I going to teach these guys? Like, they, you know, they're really good. But to recognize that it, first you had to earn their trust and you had to make relationships with them. And that is something that I always prided myself on, the ability to connect with people um, and develop relationships. And so even if I, what I lacked in potential um, knowledge of teaching them our system or anything like that, I knew that I could kind of excel in the relationship department. And that's so, so such a huge part of what we do um, because, you know, you not only recruit kids before they get there, but you have to continue to recruit them while they're there and really um, remind them of why this place is the place for them. And so um, I, really just went into high gear with that and tried to just make them understand to my best of my ability um, how how much I was there for them and that I was committed to learning and growing and pushing myself. Um, and then, you know, each year now it's another, you get a little bit more experience under your belt and you get, you know, if you win now all of a sudden you get a little bit more clout, like, oh, maybe she doesn't know what she's talking about. And, you know, and um, they get more confident even in practice and in coaches meetings and on, you know, in games, making suggestions or it's your scouting report. So all of a sudden you start to kind of build um, some, um, you know, I guess equity within the, the department and within the program. And so um, when you get a kid like, you know, Stewie that comes in there, she's like all bought in because she doesn't know any different, right? She would, I'm, you know, the time she comes in, I've been there uh, 2013, I had been there four years. So, you know, I'd already started to kind of feel much more comfortable. Um, but even that being said, it was incredible to be around kids like that every day because they really are just kids who just happen to be incredibly talented basketball players. So we got to create an environment where they got to still be kids and not these superstars that people are asking for autographs and asking things of them. It was really just a, a very organic relationship. Now, what, if anything, um, did you take from Gino? Obviously, you know, being, being around a coach like him it, um, has to have every, some type of benefits or, you know, what, what, if anything, were you able to learn from him, you know, uh, over those years, over many other coaches that, that you worked under, whether it be at Minnesota or Denver, or, you know, how do you think that you've incorporated those, those things into your coaching philosophy now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's such a, a rich culture um, and a history of winning at UConn. And that doesn't happen by accident. And so I think that for me was something that was really critical to take with me. Um, you know, in addition to, you know, he's kind of a savant when it comes to, you know, offense. Um, and so I was able to pick up a lot of those things. And sometimes the wild part is you don't even realize some of the stuff that you were learning until you're put in the moment and you've got to like go to work and it's like, oh yeah, oh right, right, let's try this. And it just comes back to you, you know, or you see the game in a different way because you were able to work alongside someone like him uh, for so many years. And, you know, I mean, I think the lessons that I learned from Minnesota and from Denver were crucial in, um, you know, kind of building the foundation of, of who I was as a teacher of the game. So when I got to Connecticut, um, I felt more comfortable in that regard as well. And that's such a, a huge part, I think, of um, 
myself as a coach is being able to, you know, articulate to my kids what it is that I want them to do, how I want them to do it. And kids these days also want to know why they're doing it. Um, and so I think, you know, without you questioning my reason, I'm just going to show you this is the why and this is why it will be effective. Um, because once you know why it's effective and then you see it work, you're going to be bought into, um, you know, doing what I say the next time. It's like, well, I think she also might know what she's talking about a little bit. Um, and so that, those are things I took, but just establishing a really strong culture that would um, have, you know, expectations of winning and of excellence and of getting the right type of people, even if they're not as talented, because we spend so much time with one another that we're not going to, and I was never going to um, risk culture or uh, my team's, you know, sanity over talent. I just wasn't going to do it. I, I still won't. Uh, so, I mean, you were a part of the greatest winning streak, one of the greatest winning streaks in college basketball history, not once, but twice at UConn, you know, winning the 111 games and then you know, 90-some-odd games. Um, 99, I mean, we lost that 100th. We lost uh, that 100th. Okay, and it was well, my scout. It was my scout. Ooh. Oh! <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you had plenty of scouts that contributed to the 99 wins before that. Though, well, so. only think about the one that, though, that you didn't get, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, just look, looking back at, at those at, at those two winning streaks, and I mean, just um, what sticks out to you most? I mean, or just or looking back, you know, what what does it mean to you to, to kind of be a part of history in that in that fashion? Um, just you know, being a part of those two winning streaks, and obviously, you know, capping off with national championships that came with the winning streaks as well. Yeah, I mean, I think you know when you're in the midst of anything that that's that massive of an undertaking you're not thinking about, you know, we never talked about, it wasn't like, okay, today is number 57. Like there wasn't, you know, we didn't have a ticker or anything of that nature. It was honestly, I think it was pivotal on, to be honest about um, how I modeled the way that I approach games now, right? So um, very much like each game I'm going into thinking we're gonna win the game even if we don't have as much talent, because that's how we approach the games there. And, you know, we, throughout the midst of both of those win streaks, there were, you know, very tough opponents that we um, faced. So sometimes people will say, oh, well, UConn was in a t uh, an easy conference and that's why it happened. No, there was, you know, Notre Dame battles in there and Baylor and, um, you know, Duke and Oklahoma, like th those big time name schools, we were winning those games too, but you weren't um, worried about the streak. It just was a byproduct of the, the approach to winning. And so even with my kids, you know, last year we went on a seven game win streak, I think. And um, that was like the longest or second longest in the seven year, I don't know, some, I, I don't, I don't pay attention to that kind of stuff. So clearly those stats, I'm, I'm not delivering them properly. But my point being that we never spoke about the streak. We spoke every day, every game that we have, we put on our board, like how many games we have left and that we're going one and oh today. So if you can approach it, like it's just this game we're trying to win, the other stuff takes care of itself, but we're trying to approach this game as the most important game we're playing. Now you said earlier that, you know, that first year was overwhelming for you and it was challenging. And um, obviously you said the second year went a lot better, but that first year you out, you were able to win coach, Patriot, Patriot League Coach of the Year in your first season there. Obviously were able to guide B to the first, the first winning season in a number of years there. And then obviously um, this year you were able to, you know, uh, finish second in, in, in the league and, had three players make make an all rookie team and two make an all conference team. So you know, just just talk about what these first two years have been like as a head coach and how you were able to you know come in there and, and, and have some success you know uh, right off the bat. Yeah, I mean, I think at the beginning the struggle was just finding my style, my approach, um, just everything. Right there, like everything re was comes through you. Right. And so you get the 
I think I can't even tell you how many times I was asked, Marissa, what do you think about this? Marissa, what do you think about this? And at some point you're like, I don't know. I don't know what I think about that. What do you think about that? Tell me what you think about that. I don't want to think about that, you know? And, um, and so going through those growing pains and trying to, you know, understand how to manage a, ba a budget, how to manage people, how to manage, you know, 15 players and their emotions and their like, and then your own stuff. You know what I mean? It was just like, it's a lot. And so then by the end of the season, when you, or at least when you get to after, you know, the Christmas holiday, and now you're starting Patriot League, we started four and oh. And I started to gain confidence and it's like the same thing with the players, right? You, you know, confidence is such a, an important part of success. And I started to like things that I, I knew I could do started to come back to me. And I started to come out of the fog of like, I don't know if I can do this. And then it was like, Oh, wait a minute. And, and like, and started to like really get excited about how we could approach the games and what were some of the tweaks and the players that I had had committed to me like to work hard, you know, and they had committed to getting better. And so by the time we got into league, they were telling me like, coach, we can win this league. And I'm like, can we? Cause I wasn't really that familiar with the Patriot league, you know, but then as time went on, I'm like, Oh my gosh, okay. We can, you know, we're, we're, we're making some inroads here. And so, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to win that award, but it was total, a total testament to my staff supporting me, especially in the beginning. I mean, they, they were definitely carrying the load for me there. And then my players really believing in what it is that we were trying to accomplish. And then for this year, you know, we signed our first class. We had five kids um, in that class. And, you know, we ended up starting three freshmen at one point, um, like midway through the season. And, um, but we were always very, and I have told my kids, like the, I'm going to put whoever out there that can help us win the game in the best, best way possible. I'm, I'm, I don't have a, like, you have to sit behind this person or there's a hierarchy. The, you know, the best five, people on the court I'm going to put out there that are playing well. And, um, and they all have, you know, bought into that as well and, and understood that, you know, this is something that we want to be a part of that's bigger than ourselves. And if you truly believe that, then you will sacrifice whatever that takes to win. Um, and it's just unfortunate that we, you know, COVID came along because we really were rolling there at the end and, and everyone had this kind of feeling that, we were gonna get a chance to, to play in the NCAA tournament and it would only be the second time in school history. And to me, when I took this job, that was such a huge motivator for me that, you know, the first time ever in school history, I went as a player and now to be able to guide the team back as a, as a coach is something that, you know, I, I would love to be able to do because I think there's no other feeling like that for the players. Um, you, can, you can tell them about it, but you, you can't, you know, until you actually experience it, there, there's no other feeling. I mean, so what was that moment like, you know, having to, to basically explain to your team, you know, that obviously with the coronavirus was, was going through, how your season was kind of come to an end. Like, what, what, what was that moment like for you guys, um, just knowing how much promise you guys had uh, for this season? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, similar to other coaches, it was, um, it was pretty emotional. I mean, we were literally – scheduled to play that day on March 12th. Um, and we were in shoot around when we got the final call that, okay, that's it. And so um, I knew it was coming um, because I, right before shoot around, I had seen like Big Ten, and I think the ACC had kind of canceled their, their uh, tournaments. So and we, everybody had, you know, their phones or their computers on kind of watching to see what was coming. Um, but I had to pretend until the Patriot League actually announced that we were still a go because we were, you know, I mean, I wasn't pretending we, they hadn't given the official word. Yeah, so we did film and we, st we, we stretched and we started guard post and then I got the text. And so I had to bring them in. And um, as you can imagine, the seniors, you know, they had the devastation for them, but even the younger kids who you know, this was an opportunity and what you talk about recruiting and getting an opportunity to play in the NCAA tournament. And you only get four chances if you're lucky um, in college. And so um, maybe five if you do an extra year, but um, you know, it was, um, 
yeah, it was one of the harder things that I've had to do. Um, and then the same time, right, you also are, we're an extension of their parents. So now you're kind of flipping into high gear of, I got to make sure they get home safely. We've got to, we've got to coordinate this. We need to, you know, look at flights. Like it just, then you go and kind of go into this very, um, uh, logistical type of mindset because you can't be emotional in that moment because you're responsible for their well-being um, until they're back and their parents, you know, care. Yep. Switching gears a little bit, obviously, right now we're going through a extremely unprecedented time with, with all these, uh, obviously, the protests and the, the racial, you know, unjust that is going on in our society today. Um, obviously, I've seen you, you're on social media and you're pretty active on, on your Twitter. Um, just the, the tweeting out thing. I seen you tweeted out a, a call to action for the killers, uh, Breonna Taylor, to, to to be brought to justice. Um, obviously, one of your players actually I saw wrote um shared, shared her her sentiments um through a, through a, through a platform as well. Um, you know, how have you kind of dealt with with this whole time? You know, with your team, what have you kind of shared with them, and how have you been kind of processing you know the events of of, of society uh going on right now? Yeah. So um, if you scroll back uh to you know a month and a half ago you would see very few posts from me on social media i um i have never been a big social media person um you know i'm i'm kind of known as a voyeur <laughs> um, i just read things and look at things but i've never really um thought that anything that i was doing was that exciting that other people would be into it nor did i necessarily want people to know where i was all the time so um but when um, when George Floyd was murdered and when, um, you know, protests erupted and then Breonna Taylor's murdered and Ahmaud Arbery and countless other, you know, names of, of young men and women, um, I just, I felt like I do, I do have a platform as being a Division One head coach and I did have a responsibility to not only... Um, the black community, but to the Boston University community to be a voice for those students, um, for student athletes, and to to, to really, um, it was the first time I felt like um, I wanted to voice how I was feeling to the world um, because it was so important. And so um, I made a statement, um, you know, I think I was the first person to make a statement from our university on it. Um, but I just was very moved, um, about everything that was going on and it made me, um, you know, think of my father and my boyfriend and so many other black men in my lives and, um, black women in my life and, um, and black kids that, you know, my nieces and nephews and, and just the, the kind of insidious nature of racism that has permeated our entire society for, you know, over 400 years. And, you know, these aren't the first time, uh, th this isn't the first time that we, there's been protests. Uh, these aren't the first time um, that we're having these types of conversations. And I've been very active in each job that I've been um, at in each university um, in this space because it has been something that is very um, important to me. And um, so this isn't a new role for me per se. And at all of the institutions that I've worked, I've been the only black female um, full time, I believe, um, assistant coach and now head coach. And so I also, you know, um, I think potentially at UConn, there might have been one other. Um, but I, um, I have been a, a, a lone voice when it comes to a black female and, um, you know, I've occupied predominantly white spaces my entire life through my schooling, um, you know, first through 12th grade, I was in the Metco program, bus from Springfield to Longmeadow, um, and then to on to um, BU, again, another PWI. So to me, it was, it's, it's part of the fabric of, of me. And I just knew that I needed to, to speak up and speak out. I mean, you mentioned that, that you've been in this role at kind of every institution that, that you've been at. I know you were involved in the um, Committee on Diversity at UConn um, and as, as well, I believe at Denver, with uh, diversity and equity and things like that. Um, 
I mean, and you mentioned obviously now be you, but you being the only African American coach. You know, for you, why do you feel like it's so important um, for you to kind of be that person to kind of speak up things um, and just role is and, and all that? Yeah, I mean, I think you know you talk about like a voice for the voiceless, right? And so I feel like I am. Um, you know, relatively well versed in in the history, and um, I feel like personal anecdotes that have happened to me or to family members, um, I can share. And I feel like I have a pretty um, direct way that I communicate with people, um, and I feel like I've I've earned um, respect by what I've been able to accomplish in my career, and so therefore that's given me um some you know ability um or you know i don't want to say clout but it's given me um some you know leeway <laughs> to to speak my mind because it's not like here comes this you know this woman who is just like out here telling people folks what they need to do and she's not even doing her job it's like no no i am going to do my job and I'm going to be able to speak on this, the social injustice in our, our communities because it is that important to be, um, to be both, to both communities um, of people. And I've taken it as a huge responsibility for my team. You know, we have had several conversations. You know, we have had conversations that I asked our athletic director to have amongst our entire athletic department because I think it's so critical that it's not just conversations, but you start there. And then now how do we affect change through action? And so, um, you know, we're reading a book with my team right now called um, $40 Million Slaves. And it's the story of the black athlete. And we're gonna be going through that. And my team is predominantly white. And, you know, I, I wrote in the, speech, or in the statement that I put out that where do we start and people are overwhelmed with how do we really kind of make the change? Well, I feel like you start at home and home for me is my team and then my athletic department and then my conference and so on and so forth. And so I think, you know, if I am not having those types of conversations, if I am not um, pushing you know, the conversation and, and trying to change the narratives um, that have for so many years been the same, then I also am part of the problem. And so um, I also am very um, interested in there being a ripple effect with the kids that I can impact and how they um, carry themselves in the world going forward and, and to their children and so on. So I think there's a lot of work to be done um, and I've just tried to be very um, strategic in the way that I've approached it here at BU. Yeah. Now, one thing that's been extremely prevalent going on recently is, you know, you've seen a lot, of, a lot of athletes that have been, you know, that have had problems with the way their coaches have addressed or lack thereof, you know, these issues. Obviously, a lot of people, we, we, I've seen three, three Liberty players, one, one uh, female basketball player, Asia Todd, have transferred from Liberty because of, of their, she, she cited um, racial insensitivity on campus as well as there were two football players that, that did the same. And I've spoken to a lot of other athletes that have had problems with the way that their coaches and their universities have responded to, to these issues. So, you know, as a black coach, you know, as somebody that, that, you know, does have some perspective on things that are going on, how do you think that, you know, other white coaches, other white administrators, if you had any advice to them as to how to tackle these issues with their teams, these predominantly white teams, you know, the uh, majority of the times, um, how do you think, how would you instruct them to do so? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've talked with, you know, within our department about this and the idea, I've tried to equate it to, you know, we are all competitors um, and we are, all, we are all educators. And in order for us to have, who, to have risen to the level of being coaches at the collegiate level, we have had to go to seminars, um, you know, coaching clinics, we've read books, we have educated ourselves in the areas in which we want to get better at. And so this is no different, right? This is an area that if you lack knowledge, it's not that it's not out there. The information is out there that if you lack that knowledge, go find out about it and also be humble enough to get out of the way if you don't know the answers and find somebody who can come in 
and also have those conversations because we're not going to read our way out of this. And I think that's something that we just talked about yesterday. We had a day of reflection at BU. This is not a situation where, you know, you read enough books and you're like, oh, I get it. No, this is an ongoing thing. But what I've told them also is once you see it, once the wool is pulled back from your eyes, you can't unsee this because it's in every part of our world. It is woven through every job, every book, every industry. And so it, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And they're exhausted by this because you know it's difficult as a black person in America to have lived in this context in this country. But now it's like, join us. Join us in the discomfort and join us in the conversation that has been going on for 400 plus years and that you have been or your ancestors have been a part of and been benefactors of the privilege that's out there. And now how are you going to use that privilege to change, to really affect change? And so many folks are like, well, I'm not sure what I want to do or I don't, I'm not privileged because I've worked hard. No, no, no. That's not what white privilege is. You were given a 400 plus head year head start. That's where your privilege was. Even though your ancestors came here and potentially they were, you know, uh, leaving and, and fleeing famine and fleeing dictatorship and everything else, they came on their own volition. They came of their own volition and black people were brought here in chains and indigenous people were, you came here and you stole their land. You were the original looters. So if we have those conversations, if you are willing to have those types of conversations, then we can get somewhere. But you have to be willing to lean into the discomfort and you have to be willing to admit what you don't know. Right. I think that's a very well stated and um you know i definitely uh, applaud you for that and as somebody you know me and my brother who have tried to speak out on these type of things you know it's definitely you know um rewarding for, to hear that as well for us um for us so you know definitely appreciate that um and my question for you would be do you guys have any plans going forward um within your program to kind of shine light on this you know maybe going into the season or or anything you guys are planning on doing right now to kind of shed light on this situation yeah, so um, our our student athletes of color, SAOC, have created a, a group that was coming together before this happened, but um, the membership, as you can imagine, has um, increased. And it's not just student athletes of color. There's also allies that are in there, which I think has been um, great too. Um, you know, within our team, uh, we are looking to, um, you know, not only read books, but to um, have a continued conversation to really shed light on, um, you know, what is going on in the world and how can we have a ripple effect within our campus community. Um, you know, BU has had, yesterday we just had a day of reflection um, and very excited that the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, um, Ibrahim X, excuse me, Ibram X. Kendi um, is going to be coming to BU and he's starting an anti-racist center, uh, which is the first in the nation. And so very, very excited about his um, joining our faculty and the work that he's going to be doing here at BU. And so hoping that we can partner with him. Yeah, it's big deal, big deal. Um, so hoping that he can partner with athletics. Um, and we have the Howard Thurman Center here. Um, and so Howard Thurman was, um, you know, he, his, his whole kind of mission was uh, for common ground. And so, um, you know, we've done some excellent work with one of the directors there, Nick Bates, and he has been a moderator with our campus or our athletic department conversations. And so um, he's so well versed in Thurman as a, a scholar of his. And, um, you know, Howard Thurman was a advisor to MLK and he was the first black um, dean of a predominantly white school. Um, and so it's just, we, there's some really um, great resources here at BU that we're gonna tap into, um, as well as trying to figure out, you know, how can we change the structure um, of, and reimagine the system of academics at PWIs? And how can we 
you know, change the narrative around what, it, what an athlete or what a student athlete or even just a student looks like um, in these environments. And then also how do we create an environment at these institutions, not just to recruit them there, but to make sure that they are um, supported and feel like they have a sense of, um, of belonging. And so, you know, it's daunting, no doubt, but, um, but I am encouraged that we've got some, um, some great resources and some great uh, support and some great partners in our, in our quest. And um, I, uh, I have a big voice um squeaky wheel gets the oil and so i'm just squeaking my ass off <laughs> yeah we love your big voice and, and we we as, as african-american athletes um appreciate you know people that are in, in your position that are using your platform to educate and to speak out on these issues and obviously we know you guys are going to keep on keeping on over there at bu so we wish you guys the best of luck obviously uh, next year going forward and obviously with, with all that you guys have going on on campus and everything and we we definitely uh, support you guys here at All Facts Media. So thank you for your time, Coach, and best of luck going forward. Thank you so much. And, you know, I wish you all the best of luck to see, you know, two brothers and brothers, literally, um, <laughs> doing this um, is really, um, it's it's exciting. Um, I think that our, um, the media world needs, you know, to have representation is so important in all facets. And so um, I wish you all the best, and I'm excited to kind of see where your career goes from here. Thanks a lot, Coach. Appreciate it. All right, best of luck. Thanks, uh -huh. Thanks again.